Am I good? All right. Um, right, so I want to talk today about uh, basically uh, how one can use uh, certain results uh, that were derived in the context of convex programming hierarchies uh, to get algorithms for calculating partition functions. Um, all right, um, so just to make sure we're all on the same page, let me first kind of remind you of the basics of what partition functions are. And so to do that, even before that, let me remind you what uh, graphical models are. So an undirected graphical model is just a way to compactly specify a distribution. Um, so for example, if you look at the image on the left there, uh, this you can interpret as a distribution over 0, 1 to the 4 in the obvious manner. And then the way the probability distribution is specified is that it's proportional to the exponential of essentially the sum over the edges of the graph of some local potentials phi ij. And then the partition function is basically the normalizer in that proportional to equation. Um, so if you haven't seen this before, you might ask, so, you know, why would you care about calculating this partition function? Well, okay, that might you may not care about, but you certainly might care if you have this in practice to calculate marginals of the distribution. So you might ask, what's the probability of, of rain, or what's the probability of you know rain given that the pavement was wet? And it turns out that this is very closely related to calculating the partition function. When in fact, they're interreducible one to another. Uh, more theoretically speaking, you might care about this because this is a Sharpie type or counting type of problem, which you might contrast with MAP, which is maybe a more common task. Um, which here in this example would basically be what's the most likely configuration uh, of the nodes in the graph. And this is an NP type of problem. Okay, so in fact, I'll actually talk about even very particular types of graphical models here for concreteness, uh, which are easing models. So these are distributions over the hypercube, uh, which have that particular exponential form written there. Um, so basically, it's just proportional to the exponential of the sum over the some edges of some potential Gij times x uh, xj. Uh, so before I move on from this introductory part, let me maybe just uh, very briefly justify to you why these, uh, why these particular uh, probability distributions are you know, sensible or useful or people like them in practice. So there's the usual typical reasons that people cite are the following. So one is they have this uh, nice ind conditional independence structure. So for example, if you look at the picture on the right, if you look at the blue node and a, a condition on its neighbors, which are the red nodes, then basically that node is independent of anything else. Uh, there's also a converse to this which typically goes by the name of the Hammersley-Clifford theorem, but I don't really want to go into that uh, too much here. Uh, this, this independent structure actually makes them arguably somewhat interpretable, so you could say that the nodes which are nearest to you are somehow most related to you, though in all fairness, this can sometimes be a little bit misleading because depending on the structure of the graph and the potentials, it's, it's often the case that you might have larger dependencies to the nodes which are further away from you in the graph. Um, and finally, the, th the third reason is essentially maximum entropy considerations. Uh, this goes all the way back to Jane's. So in the case of easing models, what this would say is that if I give you a bunch of uh, pairwise moments of a distribution over the hypercube, then the distribution which maximizes the entropy and matches these, uh, these moments would be basically an easing model. And this actually is much more general than the easing models, and the buzzword here is sufficient statistics, but again, this is only kind of tangentially related, so I'm not going to go much into it. Um, okay, so how much might you go about calculating these partition functions? So if you sort of round up methods in theory and in practice, uh, on a coarse grain, there are essentially two types of uh, approaches. The first is MCMC methods, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. But the idea is essentially that you use some kind of random walk to sample from the distribution that's specified by the easing model. Um, and then you use these samples to somehow calculate the partition function. These are pretty well studied in theoretical CS. Um, and arguably, the sort of the pinnacle of this line of research uh, are two results, one due to Jerome and Sinclair, and one due to Jerome, Sinclair, and Vigoda on calculating uh, the partition functions in the ferromagnetic case, which is when all of the potentials are non-negative, and similarly in the case uh, of the non-negative permanent. Uh, variational methods, on the other hand, are uh, kind of based on reducing calculating the partition function to some sort of optimization problem. They are quite popular in practice for various reasons, but uh, which are somewhat tangentially related to the talk, so again, I don't want to go into it, uh, but are very poorly understood in theory, other than in some very, very specific cases like uh, bounded tree width graphs or uh, sort of uh, or tree leg graphs or, or, I don't know, graphs with a small number of loops. Um, and so, and one more remark on these sort of two uh, kind of uh, approaches is that the variational methods, unlike MCMC, are deterministic in nature, which uh, is interesting to, uh, to, to at least some subset of people in theoretical CS who are kind of interested in de-randomizing some of these German Sinclair types of, uh, types of algorithms for Sharpie type problems. Um. Okay, so what is this? Uh, so what is this talk going to be about? So I'm going to show you how uh, essentially how certain the results and intuitions that we have uh, in in some in some uh, in some problems in optimization can be basically used to get to get algorithms and guarantees for calculating partition functions. And the recipe, or sort of the sugar spice and everything nice, if you want, will be to combine variational methods with uh, well 
session name convex programming hierarchies, and also approximations of the entropy of a distribution based on its low order moments. Uh, and you'll see very soon what this actually means. Okay, so if you're going to take away one thing from this from the stock, take away this slide. Okay, um, so to have something concrete to talk about, let me tell you one theorem which you could prove using these methods. So um, let's for simplicity as assume, so I'm still flashing basically the form of the of the easing model distribution on the right there, and let's for just for simplicity assume that all of the potentials are either plus minus j for some fixed j, um, which you can think of it as some scale parameter. And then the theorem statement is the following. Suppose that the graph which specifies the easing models is del delta dense. So delta dense means that each of the nodes in the graph has at least delta times n neighbors. Then the claim is that there is an algorithm which is based on one particular type of convex programming hierarchies, hierarchies called the shirley adams hierarchies, which can get you an approximation of epsilon times n squared times delta times j to log of the partition function, and which runs in time n to the roughly 1 over delta epsilon squared. Uh, alternatively, you can also think of it as a 1 plus epsilon to the factor of n squared delta times j multiplicative approximation to the partition function. And this uh, factor of n squared delta j should not really surprise you that much. This is basically just the sum of the absolute values of the potentials over all of the edges in the graph. Okay? Um, so let me make a few remarks on the statement of the result, and then I'll sort of tell you how, how you might get such a result. So you should think of this really as a direct analog of a classical result due to Aurora and all from the 90s, on getting p tests for essentially maximum constraint satisfaction problem on uh, dense instances. Uh, very importantly, this result will hold regardless of the scale of the potential, so basically regardless of the size of j. I mean, certainly the guarantee is worse if j is larger, but still the result is true not nevertheless. And it works in particular beyond this uh, regime, which is called correlation decay. So correlation decay is essentially occurs when, the, uh, loosely speaking, when the potentials are low enough that uh, sort of nodes which are far away in the graph don't really depend on each other. And this is typically the regime where many of the provable algorithms actually give you something. And third, as far as I know, basically this is the only, the, the only way I know how to show that any convex variational method gives anything provable beyond sort of some semi-trivial instances like, again, bounded truth graphs, graphs with a single loop, or sort of some kind of sort of silly instances, basically. Okay, um, so I think now I want to give you a little bit of a flavor of on how the result is proved. So uh, uh, recall that the sort of the first ingredient is these variational methods, and uh, they're essentially all based on a very, very simple lemma, which dates back all the way to Gibbs, and this is the Gibbs from physics from the 1800s. It's really that old. Um, so the lemma says the following, uh, if P is the distribution which is specified by the easing model, then for any other distribution mu over the hypercube, you have the following inequality. Log of the partition function is upper bounded by the sum over the uh, edges of the graph of jij, the expectation under mu of xi xj, plus the entropy of mu. And moreover, equality is achieved when mu is equal to P. So how should you interpret this? So basically, you can interpret this as saying that P is the distribution which in some sense has a large entropy and has a large expected energy if you view, if you view the, like the easing model as specifying some sort of energy in that exponential. Uh, and as a consequence of this, you know that the log of the partition function is uh, the maximizer over a distribution's mu in the hypercube of that expression in the brackets there. Okay, so what did we do? So basically, okay, we reduced calculating the partition function to some sort of optimization problem, but uh, unfortunately, we need to optimize over this polytope of uh, of distributions over the hypercube, which is intractable on its own. So now what we do is we instead will optimize over a polytope, uh, over a polytope of pseudo-marginals, uh, and I'll explain what that is, and this is done using uh, convex programming hierarchy. So this was the second ingredient, if you recall. So one slide intro to hierarchies, uh, in fact, what I'm presenting here is what's called the shirley adams hierarchy. So uh, these hierarchies are all essentially some way to approximate uh, better and better the polytope of distributions over the hypercube by trading off essentially runtime. So for example, if I have some parameter k, and the, then the kth level of this hierarchy will have as variables, uh, basically, uh, it will have as variables the local probabilities over sets of some size bounded by k, let's say, and the, and the constraints that you are going to impose on these variables are essentially the obvious ones. So basically, if you look at, it if you look at any subset, uh, the variables need to marginalize out to one because it's a probability distribution, and if you, take it, if you look at the probability distributions that are specified by two subset s and t, such that the size of s union t is less than or equal to k, then on the overlap, they basically need to specify the same distribution. On the intersection, they need to specify the same distribution, which is what that second inequality there uh, says. And it turns out that this can be written as a linear program, which is not too difficult, actually, to do. 
Okay, so now where are we at? Um, so recall what we're trying to do is that we're trying to relax this, exp this, uh, this maximization problem over the hypercube. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change a little bit how that maximization is done. So first I'm going to maximize over the values of the pairwise marginals, and then I'm going to maximize over all distribution which match those marginals. And then I'm leaving the same uh, expression inside the brackets. So now contrast this to what happens when you do the relaxation. So when you have the relaxation, what you have is a maximization over some variables which are some tentative marginals that there may or may not be, they may or may not come from a valid distribution over the hypercube. The second maximization basically disappears. So now in order to actually fully specify what the relaxation is going to be, I need two ingredients. So I need to have some proxies for this expectation operator and for the entropy. So the expectation you can imagine is not too difficult to find a proxy for because you have variables for the pairwise marginals and you know and the expectation is really linear in, the, in these things. So this is basically you do the obvious thing there. The problem is what do you do with the with the with the proxy for the entropy? So in principle, so let's let's maybe think what we need out of this functional. So you want this functional to basically give you the maximum uh, possible entropy that any distribution which matches some second order marginals might have. Okay. And this is a little bit a little bit tricky. I mean, you have really no sensible handle on distributions which match certain second order marginals. Uh, and actually those might not even be proper marginals. They may just be like, you know, some they're tentative marginals which come from a hierarchy. They they may not actually come from a valid distribution. Uh, so before telling you what I uh, what, what I do, so what do you know, typically practitioners like doing here? So a popular choice is what's called the beta approximation. So uh, I'm flashing the expression for, th for that uh, right there, but uh, it, that's not sort of so relevant what the particular expression is. The way you get it is you assume that the easing model is a tree. You write down the expression for the entropy, which in this case only depends on the pairwise marginals, and then you use the same expression for any graph whether or not it's a tree. So there are two issues with these. First of all, it's not really, this is not really an upper bound on the, on the entropy of a distribution which matches uh, some second order marginals. So basically you're not really getting a relaxation anymore if you're gonna use this, uh, if you're gonna use this functional. And second, this is not necessarily concave. So the, so the problem you're left with is not just like convex minimization, so you're in trouble there as well. The reason why people like this in practice is that uh, you can in principle try to solve this non-convex program with some, uh, with some sort of belief propagation, you can view belief propagation as some sort of iterative way to solve this uh, relaxation and then this, typically tends to work when the potentials are graph are sufficiently weak and the graph is locally tree-like. Okay, so I'm going to put my TCS cap on and uh, basically what I'm going to do is instead is I'm going to do a proper relaxation and then I'm going to exhibit a rounding to sort of check what the integrality gap is. Uh, and note that basically because of this entropy functional, it will be very important to produce a distribution rather than just a, a point assignment, which is the case in optimization. Uh, so how you get this rounding, so Let's sort of think a little bit again. Basically, if you look at the expression for log of the partition function, it has two terms. It has uh, this entropy and this energy type of term. So the strategy will be the following. I want to preserve both, essentially both terms as far as possible when I'm doing the, as much as possible when I'm doing the rounding. So my strategy will be that I'm going to come up with a distribution which matches this entropy exactly, and then I'm just going to worry about what it does to the uh, energy, uh, to the energy portion of the objective. Um, it turns out, uh, I mean, I think it, this is very natural and pretty much the, you know, the, when you think about it from this point of view, the only sensible thing to do is to say, well, okay, I only have a handle on the, on the entropy through its lower order marginals, and what I can do is, I can, in order to produce a valid relaxation, I'll just use the chain rule. So basically, the, the functional is exactly what I'm writing there. It's the minimizer of all subset S of essentially applying the chain rule with S and everything else independently from S. And then you can check that this is, this is concave, and this actually does produce you a valid uh, distribution. So now you have to worry about uh, how do I pres how what, what rounding actually preserves this functional. It turns out there's a, there's a natural candidate for this as well, which is correlation rounding, and which was basically first proposed by Barack Raghavendra and Storer in the context of unique things, and then it was also used by Yoshida and Zo in, for in some other context. But basically the idea is that uh, what it says that you can find the subset S of, s s of size 1 or epsilon squared such that you can condition on it, and then the average par pairwise correlation of the, rest of, the, of the rest of the nodes conditioned on this is less than epsilon. Using this, you can show that when the graph is dense, the energy functional is preserved up to an additive factor of epsilon delta n squared times j. But now bear in mind, what does this distribution do? It, it takes a set S and then rounds it according to its local distribution. Everything else is independent based on that. So basically, you're exactly matching the pseudo-entropy functional that you just came up with. So this basically more or less finishes the proof.
Okay, so in summary, what uh, I gave you here, it's a, it's a new basically algorithm based on convex relaxations for, for approximating partition functions. The recipe was basically to come up with, uh, to essentially relax the usual variational principle, come up with some entropy approximations and roundings which respect these entropy approximations. But this is kind of pretty generic and actually works for many other things other than just easing models. And there are many, many open questions which you might want to ask here. So for example, probably from a theoretical perspective, the most tantalizing one is to get like a one plus epsilon to the n factor approximation for, for the ferromagnetic easing case in time, something like n to the one over poly of epsilon, and the same thing for non-negative permanence. And bear in mind the state of the art here is quite, uh, quite sad. Uh, there's only a two to the n factor approximation, which is actually fairly recent due to Gurwitz and Samorodnitsky. On a more practical side, you might want to ask whether or not you can get a one plus epsilon factor approximation for some nice class of graphs. Uh, and okay, l the last one needs some explaining, so maybe let me go over that. And 